No big shot, start explaining. Nothing to say. Go on, make a speech. You're pretty good at that. You're pretty good at everything except paying off, aren't you? Don't think you're gonna walk out on me. Not now, it isn't as easy as that. Well? Well, say something! Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes, or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. So please subscribe when you're finished listening. You can also go to ClassicMovieRev.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is Mystery Street, 1950. While Edgar Allan Poe invented the detective novel, This movie may be the grandfather of all television crime dramas. This movie highlights, at the time, little-known forensic techniques as they attempt to solve the murder of a B-girl. Mystery Street 1950 is rated at 7.1 on imdb.com and has a 65% audience approval on Rotten Tomatoes. It was nominated for an Oscar in the Best Writing category but didn't win. The film is rated around 207 of 953 film noirs listed. It is better than the above would indicate. Ricardo Montalban is strong in his first non-Latin lover role in America. Jan Sterling is about as jaded by life as any female character I've seen in a film noir. But the real surprise in this movie is Elsa Lancaster as the oddball landlady. She adds a lot of humor and much of the suspense. Actors. Right. And I'm a Shakespearean actor. Ricardo Montalban played Detective Peter Morales, a man temporarily assigned to the Boston Police Department. Montalban was first covered in episode 120, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, 1971. Bruce Bennett played the Harvard forensic scientist Dr. McAdoo. Bennett was first covered in episode 25, Sahara, 1943. Like I said earlier, Elsa Lancaster, a rooming house owner, Mrs. Smearling, was the hit of this film. She was strange, eccentric, and sneaky. Lancaster was first covered in Episode 7, Bride of Frankenstein, 1935. Marshall Thompson played Henry Shanway, a man thrown into the middle of a murder investigation because he tried to keep a secret. Thompson was first covered in Episode 50, Battleground, 1949. Jan Sterling played Vivian Heldon a B-girl that was murdered to keep another man's secret. Sterling was originally covered in episode 89, Ace in the Hole, 1951. Sally Forrest played Grace Shanway. She was born in 1928 in California. The child of two ballroom dancers, Forrest began dancing in the first grade. When she graduated from high school, she was signed to an MGM contract. Sally moved to Hollywood to work on dance films, but she was soon unemployed. She continued to work in small roles until her big break came, meeting Ida Lupino. Forrest earned the lead in Not Wanted, 1949. Other movies include Never Fear, 1950, The Strange Door, 1951, The Strip, 1951, and While the City Sleeps, 1956. She continued to work in television until 1967. Sally died in 2015. Edmund Ryan played James Joshua Harkley. Three names. Is that a clue? Ryan was born in 1905 in Kentucky. Ryan was a history teacher and a football coach before becoming an actor. He attended Yale School of Drama. He was in a lot of film noir. His movies include Battleground, 1949, The Breaking Point, 1950, Mystery Street, 1950, The Americanization of Emily, 1964, Topaz, 1969, and Tora, 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 1970. He was also very active in television. He died in 1984. Betsy Blair played Jackie Elcott and was a fellow boarder and friend of Vivian Heldon. Blair was born in 1923 in New Jersey. She was a model as a child and later worked in choral lines. In 1940, she had her first small role on Broadway. During this time, she met and married super dancer and all-around cool guy, Gene Kelly. She was not a good enough dancer to work with Kelly in a film. Blair first appeared in films in 1947 
and began making some pretty fair films. These include The Guilt of Janet Ames, 1947, A Double Life, 1947, The Snake Pit, 1948, and Another Part of the Forest, 1948. Suddenly, she came under investigation by the Un-American House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, and she was blacklisted. She was only able to play what would be her crowning role in Marty 1955 because Kelly used his clout with the studio. She was nominated for an Oscar and several other awards, but remained on the blacklist. Her marriage to Kelly ended in 1957, and she moved to Europe. While there, she married two more times and died in 2009 at the age of 85. Walter Mayer played police detective Tim Sharkey. Mayer was born in Ohio in 1908. Mayer was in a lot of movies, and a lot of his roles were uncredited. He was known primarily as a voice talent. His most well-known films include Hollywood Hotel 1937, Strange Holiday 1945, Mystery Street 1950, and The Reformer and the Redhead 1950. Mayer died in 1951. I need to take time out to do a little commercial. I really need a couple of more reviews. I hate to nag, I hate to beg, but I need a few more. It really helps the show get found. Also, the Film Noir ABC book is coming along fine and will be available for sale shortly. Look for more information on the website or in the podcast. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Like all good film noirs, this story doesn't run strictly chronologically. It begins six months in the past with a phone ringing in a modest rooming house. The phone is answered by Vivian Heldon, Jan Sterling. Jackie Elcott, Betsy Blair, comes in to pay her rent to the rooming house owner, Mrs. Smearling, Elsa Lancaster. Vivian is upset that the voice on the other end of the phone can't make their planned rendezvous. Mrs. Smearling watches Vivian write a number on the wall before going downstairs to eavesdrop on the call. Vivian says she is sorry for calling the man's home and that she is in a jam. Of course, this is code for being pregnant. Tomorrow. You'll get it tomorrow. I couldn't help it. I had to call your house. Please, honey. You gotta. I'm in a jam. She demands that the unnamed man meet her at her workplace at 10.30 p.m. Vivian is a B-girl at the Grass Skirt Bar. They have the greatest lamps with hula girls that move on the bottom. The man is not shown and Vivian has been phoning all evening. The bartender starts looking for someone that has a yellow Ford illegally parked outside. Henry Shanway, Marshall Thompson, is half drunk and in his own world, and he doesn't hear the question until the bartender is in front of him. Vivian zeroes in on the drunk Henry and selects him as her mark. Vivian moves in and says she is with him and he needs fresh air. She offers to help him move the car and orders a bottle for them on the way out. How much are you out? Three fifty. Same thing I've been drinking, whatever that is. How much? Nine bucks altogether. Keep the change. Outside, a tattoo artist is showing his wares by letting the customer look at the tats on his own body. The tattooist talks to Vivian on the way to the car. She drives and Henry is in a haze. He lets out that his wife is in the hospital having just had a miscarriage. He keeps drinking until he passes out again. Vivian drives out to the Cape and stops at a place called the Dunes. The all-male clientele can't believe what they are seeing. Vivian uses the phone and says she is coming to the man's house, but he agrees to meet her someplace else. Henry comes too and comes into the diner. Vivian ushers him back to the car. He can't believe they're on the Cape. Where is she? 
Hey, what's the idea? I forgot something. Well, look, no, no. What are we doing out here on the cave? Never mind, I'll take you later. Come on, Pat. Well, look, you said we were going. I'll on. take you back to Boston. Look, oh. Why did you bring me out here? Why did you bring Never me out Never mind, I'll here? tell you later. Come on, get up in the car. Hey, hey, I'll drive. I'll drive. Get it. Shut the door. She keeps driving. When Henry realizes she is still going away from Boston, Vivian tricks him to getting out of the car. She drives away, leaving Henry on the roadside. Vivian pulls into a secluded beach spot, and the man shows up. She starts by giving the man the business. Without speaking, he shoots the seated woman. No big shot, start explaining. Nothing to say. Go on, make a speech. You're pretty good at that. You're pretty good at everything except paying off, aren't you? Don't think you're going to walk out on me. Not now. It isn't as easy as that. Well? Well, say something! The man pulls her out of the car and is almost caught by another couple driving through. The man strips the body and leaves it on the beach. He takes Vivian's clothes and Henry's car and sinks them in a lake. The car completely submerges. What a sickening feeling it would be if the car rested on the bottom and stuck out of the water four feet. Three months into the past, or future, depending, Henry gets a check for his stolen car. Henry says he left the keys in the car when he went into the hospital. Three months after that, an ornithologist, Walter Burke, is stalking birds, and he sees the bones of a foot, all still attached to the leg and tarsal sticking out of the sand. Nope. Wouldn't happen. The local constable calls in Boston Police Detective Peter Morales, Ricardo Montabon, to take the case. Morales boxes the bones and is told on the phone by the DA to take the bones to a Harvard laboratory at the legal medical department. Eventually, Morales and his partner, Tim Sharkley, Walter Mayer, find the office of Harvard medical professor Dr. McAdoo, Bruce Bennett. Dr. McAdoo takes possession of the bones. McAdoo shows some of the cases that were solved by forensic science. A few days later, Morales goes to see McAdoo. The first thing he is shown is dark hair that has been bleached blonde. The dead leaves under the body give them a rough date that the body was dumped. They're darker at one end, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Dark and natural, white and bleached. That makes it a blonde. Well, or the murderer was a blonde. Then it was murder. If it was murder. So far we've got blonde hair. Mm-hmm. Now those leaves you brought in... Keep low blueberry, poison ivy. Uh, yeah. Now here's the poison ivy. Now, if these plants stop growing the day the body covered them. They're almost in full leaf. Besides, they should be the end of May. Then we know the date of the murder. Well, not necessarily. I suppose the body had been dead for weeks when it was brought there. If it was brought there. Then what have we got? A rough working date, say the week of May 20th. You'll have to go back and look for some more bones and sift the sand to a depth of, oh, at least a foot. What for? She's not all here. She? Oh, yes, definitely a lady. That was easy. I uh, suppose you'd like to know her age. I'd also like to know her height, weight, occupation, and the name and phone number of the person who murdered her. <laughs> I think we can answer all those questions except the last. Age? Between 20 and 24, uh, probably closer to 24. That's only a guess, of course. Oh, not really. You see, it isn't until you reach the age of 25 that all the bones get really solid. Uh, she's just about completed that process. Occupation? Maybe. What people do often marks them. Sometimes psychologically, sometimes physically. Uh, let's take this foot. When this bone is this heavy, it makes me think she was a toe dancer. Now as to height, there are several ways. The application of Pearson's formula to this thigh bone would indicate she was about 65 inches tall. McAdoo says that not all of the bones are present and they have to sift the sand at the murder site and that the body is a female. McAdoo uses bone fusing to say she is 24 years old. The feet bone shows she is a toe dancer. She is estimated to be 5 foot 5 inches tall. Morales gets files on all the missing females from the local area. Morales and McAdoo use copies of the photograph and Vivian's skull to find the match. Finally, it matches a photograph of the missing Vivian. Length and width, all right. I thought it's good. He's perfect. I'd say this could be the girl. That's good enough for me. Heldon Vivian, 24, 5 feet 5, reported missing by Jacqueline Elcott, May 30th, 
317 Bunker Street, Boston. We'll check on it. I'll call you later, Doctor. Thank you. The notes say she was 5'5 five five at 24 years old. Morales is off in a flash to investigate. Before long, Morales and his partner end up at Mrs. Smearling's rooming house. Mrs. Smearling says Jackie Elcott is asleep. Morales starts questioning Mrs. Smearling. She has to hide her booze bottles. All rooming house owners drink, right? Yes? Uh, yes. Good afternoon. I'm looking for a lady. Oh, yes, indeed. By the name of Jacqueline Elcott? She's asleep. Works nights, you know. Sweet, very sweet. Yes, but I... Uh... Who shall I say call? Will you just call him now, please? Of course. I'm hardly responsible for what my room Just call do. her. Hmm? Uh, yes, indeed. Oh, Jackie! Uh, Jackie! Yeah, Mrs. S? Uh, better come down at the... It's a gentleman caller named... Who are you? Uh, Mrs. Smirling. I own this rooming house and I've never had any trouble. Uh, whatever it is that Jackie has done, not that she would do anything, mind you. Is your husband here? Uh, not exactly. Were you ever married? Not exactly. Jackie says she reported Vivian missing and she was last seen leaving the grass skirt. Jackie has Vivian's suitcase, but Mrs. Smearling has sold her other goods. Morales finds toe shoes in the suitcase. Morales tells the two ladies that Vivian is dead. Mrs. Smearling goes and gets the number Vivian wrote on the wall the night she went missing. She is next shown at the dock talking to James Joshua Harkley, Edmund Ryan. She's wearing a dead animal around her neck and is all dolled up. She says she and Vivian were very close. Harkley is called out of the room and Mrs. Smearling rifles through his desk. She finds a locked drawer with a 45 caliber pistol inside. When Harkley comes back, she shoves the gun in her purse after relocking the drawer. Mrs. Smearling says she wants to give Vivian a decent burial. Harkley says he never knew Vivian. Mrs. Smearling wants money but he throws her out with no money. Your telephone number is Hyannis 3633, isn't it? I never forget a number. <laughs> Not that I listen to people's conversations, you know, but uh, you know how it is, don't you? What do you want? Only a few dollars. After all, I know that you've got a family, Mr. Hartley, and that you're a very respectable man. Don't you think I know that? You know the penalty for blackmail? Really, Mr. Hockley? The idea of blackmail? For just a few dollars? Oh, don't be silly. Get out. <laughs> I said get out. Poor Vivian. Without a grave to call her own. Perhaps she's listening to us right now. Mrs. Smearling says Vivian has no grave of her own as she leaves. Morales goes to the grass skirt and interviews the bartender. The bartender remembers the yellow Ford and confesses to bootlegging. Morales runs down other men that have known Vivian. One is a mortician, Willard Waterman, who was friendly with Vivian for a time. He is cleared because he was at the mortician's conference. He then makes a pitch to get paid for the funeral. Then Morales finds out from a doctor that Vivian was pregnant. Morales goes to work on the yellow Ford. Word leaks to the press that Vivian was a B-girl. Morales quickly finds the report of Henry's stolen yellow Ford. Henry sees in the newspaper that Vivian is dead. About that time, Morales shows up and ruins his domestic bliss. Funny, uh, you find in the car, uh, after our claim's been paid, I mean... Uh, we're about to buy a new one. It hasn't been found. Oh? Where was it stolen from, Mr. Shanwee? Well, I was at the Boston Lying in Hospital. Thank you. Visiting me. Uh, car was parked outside. That, that's the last I saw of it. Ah, uh, sugar? Please. When was it stolen? On May 23rd at night. That was the night Grace lost her baby. 
When were you in the hospital, Mrs. Shanway? Well, I told you it was. I asked Mrs. Shanway. In front of his wife, Grace Shanaway, Sally Forrest, Morales asks Henry if he knows Vivian and that she left work with a man in a yellow four. Morales leaves after doing his little Columbo act. Henry assures his wife that he did not know the woman. Morales is back in the office checking on when Henry's wife was in the hospital. Dr. McAdoo comes in and tells Morales that one of the rib bones they found during the sifting was broken. He also has some bones from the unborn child. One of the ribs is cracked. Don't know what to make of that yet. Hmm. Did you know there were some extra bones? Why no? Mm-hmm. Thought they might give you a motive. Proved to be from an unborn child. My guess is about three months. I was going to... Yes? I see, nurse. Thank you. I was going to tell you the same news. How did you know? Undergraduate work. Professors work with their heads. Cops work with their feet. See this little book? 86 names. Almost all of them men. One of them is a murderer. It's a long shot, Pete. The tattooist comes in and wants to make sure the killer is found. He says he could ID the man if he saw him again. The newspaper picture gets him a call from the man at the Dunes Cafe. Morales and McAdoo drive out to the Cape. Morales' partner, Tim Sharkey, is already out there dragging freshwater ponds for the car. The cafe man remembers the girl in the fight, but not the man. Sharkey comes flying in, says they have found something metal, and are grappling to hook it up. As soon as the car is pulled out, Morales matches the tag to Henry. They bring Henry in for a lineup. They get a lot of positive IDs on Henry. Mrs. Smirling says he came by the house two times after Vivian was missing. For some reason, his wife, Grace Shanway, is there watching the ID process. Morales grills Henry until he confesses that Vivian took the car. Henry says he went to the house to look for his car. Henry comes clean to the whole story and emphatically says he did not kill her and she left him stranded. Morales tells McAdoo that he has gotten Henry indicted. McAdoo says the broken rib was the result of a gunshot wound because of lead traces on the bone. Morales is pretty upset, and McAdoo tells him they need to go see the yellow Ford. They have Morales sit in the car, and McAdoo lines up the rib shot. They tear into the car and find the hole. It's a magic bullet just laying on the undercarriage. They decide it is a 45 automatic and maybe a Colt. McAdoo goes to check the bullet metal against the rib metal. Morales goes to the Shanway house. Grace is moving out and she is very angry. Morales searches the house for a gun that Henry says he does not own. He then asks for the month of May's canceled checks. She reads checks until she collapses. Morales begins to unpack for her. Morales meets a DA and tells that he is having second thoughts about the case. Grace comes in and the press mobs her. Morales has to save her. Morales tries to convince her that her husband did the crime. She doesn't go for it. She gets to meet with her jailed husband. Grace finally asks her husband if he had been with Vivian. Later, Morales' partner reminds him that they are looking for a gun. He begins checking on everybody that has a forty-five. Easier in 1950, I would say. When he gets to Harkley, he also knows that a call was made from the boarding house. Mr. Harkley? Yes? I'm from the Barnstable District Attorney's Office. Oh, one of my hunkies in trouble again? All kinds of people have trouble, Mr. Harkley. Morales searches for the pistol, but it's not there. After Morales leaves, Harkley realizes that Mrs. Smirling stole his gun. Once it is reported to the paper that Vivian was killed by a forty-five. Mrs. Smirling checks the gun she took from Harkley. Mrs. Smirling asks Jackie about the gun. Jackie knows all about guns and unloads the clip. She places it in her pocket. That night at work, Jane Shanway comes to see her. Jackie recommends that Jane go see Mrs. Smirling. Jackie sees the paper and calls Morales about the gun Mrs. Smirling has. Mrs. Smirling has a key to a luggage checkbox. When her bell rings, she hides the key in the birdcage. Harkley comes in and they have a few drinks. My, invigorating, isn't it? Well, they always say one swallow never makes the summer. <laughs> Harkley tries to pay her off with $500, but now that she has the gun, she wants a trip to Europe. She wants at least $20,000. Harkley starts choking her, and she tells him that the gun is checked at Trinity Station. Jane Shanway rings the bell, 
and Harkley clubs Mrs. Schmierling to keep her from getting help. Harkley opens the door and throws Jane on the floor near Mrs. Schmierling. He runs to the basement and escapes through the window as Morales runs in the front door. Tim and Morales follow the fleeing Harkley. They lose Harkley and go back to Mrs. Schmierling's apartment. Jackie and Jane are both there. Morales calls Dr. McAdoo to help with the crime scene. Morales looks around and tries to blame Jane for the murder. Morales gets a phone call saying Henry Shanway escaped. Mrs. Schmierling dies. Aww. Morales cracks hard on Jane. It's not possible, of course, that you came here to meet your husband. And nobody would even consider that you both did this. Nobody except me. That's better, Mrs. Shanway. When in doubt, start crying. On the way out, Morales sees the key and claim check. The two detectives head for Trinity Station. Harkley bluffs the baggage claim guy into giving him the bag containing the gun without him having the key. Morales and Tim get to the station just after Harkley gets the bag. They chase him out into the rail yard. Harkley jumps tracks and runs through parked train cars. Harkley pulls the gun out of the bag thinking it is still loaded. Morales knows it's not and arrests Harkley. Morales tells Tim to radio the department not to shoot Henry Shanway on sight. He calls the boarding house and tells Jane that her husband will be with her soon. World famous short summary, don't let other people drive your car. Hope you enjoyed today's show. I really appreciate you spending the time listening. You can find connections to social media and email on my site at classicmoviereb.com. There are links in the podcast show notes as well. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All I ask is that you jump over to Apple Podcast and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware the moors.